How does building an online business compare to scaling mountains and crossing deserts? Well, we're about to find out. Please give a warm, magenta welcome to Jamie Clark. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Woo! Thank you. I was going to do that on the beatbox. How's everybody doing? This is a really uh, a great treat to be here. I'm honored to have the chance to come here. I, we have a short period of time. I know I stand between you and something fun that's going to happen here that I saw in the back, and of course the accoutrement that is offered in Vegas. So my mission is uh, to uh, not go long and not to suck. <laughs> and in the spirit of both of those, uh, let's get started right away. I was asked in the back earlier, how, is it, how, do, you, how do you become an adventurer? Sort of a weird job title, life path thing. I actually wanted to be a hockey player. I grew up in uh, Canada and uh, came here last night from Canada. So are there Canadians here by chance? We have some Canadians? Fantastic. There's more, but you're not going to say anything just to see how this thing goes. And if it's good, we'll talk about it. If it sucks, I'm not going to get So I wanted to play hockey. Sorry it's a cliche, but Canadians, we love hockey. We love the game. It's, it's, it's cold in Canada. Shit, why not play hockey? And so I wanted to be a hockey player. You can curl. That's a stupid sport, I'll tell you that. That's, uh, if you could fight in curling, I'd be into that. But no, there's no fighting in curling. Sorry. But you can smoke and drink and still be Olympic champion as a curler. So that's, that's got its benefits. Anyway, I wanted to win the Stanley Cup. I wanted to get drafted by an American team, probably out of San Diego, make US dollars, marry a movie star. Um, Justine Bateman was the one that I picked. Do, do you remember that show, Family Ties? Yes. Mallory? Oh, God. I really, that girl drives me crazy. Mallory, fantastic. So I, but I figured if I won the Stanley Cup, you know, and she'd be there, woo, good for you, and we'd be, she'd marry me, why not? That made sense. But my mom hates hockey. She thinks it's a dangerous and violent sport, so my mom suggested, you should be an adventurer, so it's my mom to blame. I'm going to be an adventurer. I thought, forget it. But for every birthday and Christmas that followed, my mom, instead of giving me the things that I wanted, I wanted power skating camp tuition. I wanted a new composite stick to improve my awesome shot. She would disappoint me birthday and Christmas over and over and give me stupid gifts like a movie series from National Geographic about the world's great adventures or atlases or books about adventure. And I would just, it pissed me off for a lot of years until I started to read the books when I was about 13. I mean, I always looked at the pictures. Yeah, they were beautiful, exotic, fantastical, big deal. But at 13, I began to read the stories. And I found in there that these stories, regardless of whether these expeditions, these adventures ended in triumph or, you know, in many cases, tragedy, those who undertook them and, and survived came home changed. Their core characters were forged anew. They were clearly, and maybe pushed by their publisher, I don't know, maybe they made it up, but it was a pretty compelling story that they were better. They were just fundamentally better for having gone through that experience. So I thought, shit, forget hockey, man. Maybe this adventuring thing is pretty good. But what would be the Stanley Cup equivalent in the world of adventuring? And from my home in Calgary, I live about 60 miles to the east of arguably one of the most beautiful mountain chains in the world. You can see the Rocky Mountains. I'll be a mountain climber. What would be the Stanley Cup of mountain climbing? And so I did my research. I pulled out the family's encyclopedia and blew the dust from its covers and actually turned the pages of paper and began digging through it. And I found this Himalayan range of mountains straddling the border of Nepal and Tibet and the tallest among them, Mount Everest. Well, that's it. I'm going to climb Mount Everest. As sure as I had won the Stanley Cup in my imagination, as sure as Justine would be there cheering me on, I'd be a mountain climber. It was a couple weeks later, I'm talking with the family, and I told my mom, okay, forget it, you're right, hockey sucks. I'm going to be a mountain climber. I'm going to climb Mount Everest. She said, no, you're not, baby. You're, you're going to play hockey. I got it. <laughs> here's the stick, and here's the camp, and you're going away to hockey school. <laughs> I, was, I basically spent the balance of my life focusing on adventures, and, and I weaseled my way onto an expedition to the Himalaya, and trying to climb Everest. And I know we had Alison Levine here, a friend of mine, a great gal, and a presenter last year, and she told you some of the stories. So you're familiar with it. I wasn't as good as her. We failed a few times in the process to get up there. We got closer each time. We got sick. Some, it was, you know, nobody died, which is good. There was some throwing up of blood and other weird things. But, you know, we made it back. And, and this idea that we're trying to conquer the mountain was something that, that seemed weird to me. I always thought we'd conquer mountains. But then after having gone there a couple of times and it clearly conquering us, I began to think, conquer. You don't conquer mountains. But there was a battle going on. I was very curious about what that battle was. What is the real foe if it's not rock and snow? And over time, I guess hopefully as I grew up and matured, I began to realize that the foe really was fear. I was there 
battling fear, you know, fear of the unknown, sure, fear of failure, fear of, of dying, of being injured, fear of ridicule, even though you pretended not to care, of judgment of others, fears like shackles paralyzing you, preventing you from moving forward. So we should conquer fear. I realize we shouldn't probably conquer. Fear is pretty handy. Fear brings energy, it causes pause for thought. You know, last night, Drew, my buddy and I, were, we were at three in the morning, we were here at the hotel, and we were sitting there at the taxi stand thinking, do we go to the strip? Do we go to the strip? Do we go to the strip? Very conflicted moment, but fear <laughs> of how we would feel today had us stay here and go to Jack in the Box instead. <laughs> which made me feel like crap today too. But anyway, that's what we did instead. So fear is pretty handy. In fact, for me, fear is an indicator you're onto some shit. Fear is like, okay, this is good. I'm scared, good. Now we're gonna learn something. But you know, why do it by yourself? You're gonna do it, I think someone on the panel mentioned teamwork, having that team. You're not gonna get this done on your own, so you need help. And we think about, well, how, who do you partner with? And I started to get into this groove of, I wanna find the people who make me an idiot, which is surprisingly not difficult, I've discovered. But I want to be in a room, and every time I'm in a room with my teammates, I need to learn something. I want to be the dumbest person in this room. It's daunting at times for certain. Your ego takes a bit of a beating, but damn, you learn a lot. And I wanted to surround myself with the best climbers and the best organizers and the best fundraisers, because we had a lot of money to raise to stage these expeditions. And I found, well, you're going to go to the Himalayas, you're going to climb Mount Everest. So what partners do you want on this team? You want the Sherpa companions. The Sherpas who live there, that Allison would have spoken about, who know this region. And with their help and this teamwork, we, we had some success. We stood upon the summit finally, and I realized this lifelong dream. I came home from that expedition, though, feeling a little, I guess, lost, because I'd had this tension of an unrealized goal to drive me forward every day, and now it was gone. I was, now what the hell do I do? Climb another mountain? I was kind of sick and tired of being cold and vertical. I wanted something different, man. I wanted something flat, something hot. So I decided we should maybe do a desert crossing. And my brother and I had spent some time in the classic sort of post-adolescence before you go get a job. We spent six months on 10 bucks a day traveling through Africa and the Middle East. A bit of a T. Lawrence fan, Lawrence of Arabia. I wanted to follow his footsteps through Jordan as he snuck up on the Turks and Aqaba in the First World War. So we reenacted that in our own weird little way. I began our research to figure out what would be the best desert? What's the Everest of deserts? What's the Stanley Cup of desert? Yeah, the Sahara, I get it. But I want a romantic desert. I want, a, I want an uninterrupted ocean of sand for hundreds of miles in every direction. Where is that? And we found a book by Sir Wilfred Thesiger, great explorer. He'd crossed such a desert. And he'd done it in 1946. Others had tried since. Some of them didn't end well, and, but no one had been successful. I thought, damn, that's what we need to do then. We need to cross the desert. We'll get some camels. We'll get this figured out. Got some sponsorship. Studied some Arabic, went to Texas, trained in the desert, burnt our butts off, but we started figuring things out. Now again, it's this idea, if we're going to do this, you know, let's go. 720 miles through Oman, or Saudi Arabia, and the UAE, let's ride these camels. And you know, it, it didn't really work out as planned entirely. Sir Wilfred, who inspired that journey, though, received us as we were traveling to the Middle East, and we met with him. He was a bit reluctant, but he warmed up. He would pull out his maps. You could see trapped in the creases sand from his 46th journey, so trickling out on the floor. And, Generously sharing ideas. You'll find water here and be careful of the Ruk Hasamim. Oh, this is a fantastic character. And at the end of it all, he gathered us around the cabs, waiting. We got to get to our airplane. He's leaning on his stick. Come round, boys, come round. And he says, I just want to say goodbye to you, for I fear you're not going to make it. <laughs> We'd come accustomed to that. You know, from our, our Canadian government, our own prime minister's office, you probably shouldn't do this. You're going to create some incident. And anyone who had knowledge of the Middle East, you'll never make it through there. But the one dude who had, and his book inspired us, we meet him, you're not going to make it. We're like, dude, why? Why? Big Willie, why? And he's like, here's the truth of it. These camels that you're going to depend upon, they're not used for tracing great distances. They don't have the, 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 the endurance. They're used for entertainment and gambling, running around in circles. And the Bedouin, they don't have the skills of the desert any longer. They have never been hardened by the sands. They're living off the spoils of oil exploration. They're driving Land Rovers sitting on the beach, man. They can't get you across the desert. You're going to dry, kept saying that, you're going to dry up like raisins. Like, so a bit of a sobering cab ride back to the airport, passing the manicured countryside of England, we're working there, but silent, no one says anything. Finally, my brother, one of our three team members, pipes up, let's just go and try. You know, if we gotta turn around, we gotta turn around, we gotta deal with Nat Geo, we gotta shoot a film, we got kids following on this education program, we gotta do this. It's like, yeah, we gotta, you know, I told us I'd much rather fail than quit. I'd rather go up on a ball of flames, man, and, and then at least I'll know. I don't want to be 20 years from now haunted by a question whose answer I can never find, you know. What if? Oh, damn it, I don't want to be cursed with that. What if? No, let's go, let's find out. If we can't do it, so be it. We'll get over that. We'll learn from that. So we went. 
And again, using the principle of surrounding ourselves with a team of experts, we partnered with our Bedouin companions. We had Ali there, you see him on the left, 18 years old, but a hell of a rider of camels. That dude can run one down. In the middle, we've got Masalem, he's got a photographic memory. Navigating across a featureless desert, very tricky, you can get lost. You start drifting east or west, you're still going north, but what the hell, where are you? You don't know. This guy would help us give these bearings. And we had Banashra, who was a poet. <laughs> I didn't realize that was an important skill for adventuring. But that's because we're ignorant, because we didn't realize that the history of the Bedouin is not recorded, written anywhere. It's in the memories of those who endured it, passed through the countless fames of hundreds of generations. This is, this is how this story is told. It's poetic, because it aids the memory. What about that song that gets stuck in your head? It works. 20 years later, you hear a tune, you're driving with your cars, and my god, the lyrics come back to you, much to the amazement and disgust of your children. <laughs> Iambic pentameter and rhyme, man, it drills it into your brain. And these are how these stories are told, and he would come and tell this story. Immediately we began our journey, it was tough slugging. Not all partners are enjoyable. Camels, not particularly friendly. Don't like to be ridden. Can't blame them, really. They kick, they bite, and yes, they do spit. It's not spitting, really, when you consider the volume. It's more like puking with accuracy. <laughs> <laughs> My camel was particularly a bitch. I'm... Tainuna, man, you see, feel your vibrating footprints in the morning and immediately <laughs> bringing up some bile saturated acacia tree leaves. <laughs> Every time a head shot. <laughs> Only once did you approach this camel with your mouth open. I'll tell you, it was nasty. Terrible creature. The desert journey was pretty tough. I can tell you that, you know, on the planning and preparation stages, all I could really think about is if we could just get there. Same thing with Everest, you know, all the preparation and planning and fundraising and logistics. Three years of effort to get on the mountain. I was just, if we could just get on the mountain, just get, do the climbing part. You know, and the dreaming of a goal and realize, you're like, oh, if we could just get to the summit, man, get to the summit. Now I'm in the desert, you know, I'm thinking, oh, God, just, just get there. Get all the sponsorship and the deals done. Let's just ride these camels. But then we get there, you know, and it's pretty miserable. Sun beating down on you every day, disappearing over the horizon, leaving you shivering in the sand, only to come back and beat the crap out of you again the next day. 126, 127 degrees, thirst on your tongue at all times. This adventuring is a bunch of crap. I promised myself when I was done, I would go home, get a proper job, and move things along. Get to the end of this thing, man, just get it over with. Live up to our commitment. The sun sets, the sun rises, the sun sets, the sun rises. Circadian rhythm of hell really. <laughs> Finally, in the distance, we smell something changing, some kind of humidity, a little salt in the air or something. No, we're getting close. Ah, could we be? Disgusted with the food that we're eating every day, unleavened bread cooked beneath the fire, the choleric demands. We didn't have much else. It's a journey. It's tough living out there. Unnecessary things are stripped away. More days, 38, 39, 40 days of constant movement. And finally, smell for real, the toll the journey takes. Even our camels are protesting. Let it be over. Again, our minds are playing trick, but then for real. And the distance and green, oh my God, the beauty of that. And the sound of birds, oh. The journey's over. We ride through the city. We throw one of our bedroom companions into the ocean thinking it's funny, ha ha ha, the dude's never been, he just <laughs> sinks right down. <laughs> Cameron, oh, mouth to mouth, <laughs> fine. The last night, we're sitting on the edge of the desert. You've got a fire in front of us. Last of one of the camels we ate. <laughs> Cold to your back, throwing bones over your shoulder. Your buddy's sitting beside you. I'm thinking, ah, you know, too bad it's over. Sure, it'd be nice if we were back in the desert, you know, riding in the saddle. Now it's done. Came home from that expedition feeling a little bit, what to do next now? I'd clearly been able to do okay with expeditions. I could raise the money and do the logistics. I could run an expedition. Desert, Everest, but could I run a business? Could I raise the millions of dollars required for that effort? And what would I do? What do I know? I know gear. I know gear. I don't know much else. I know how to climb, and I actually know how to ride a camel. Basically useless. <laughs> Back to gear then. Let's open a shop in Calgary, in our home, tough competitive environment, selling the gear that I would use, the stuff that I would use in an adventure that's not available. I've been ordering it from all over the world. Friends have been bringing it over when you travel back and forth. We gotta get this gear in here. The best of the stuff. The best made of hard shells and base layers. The best gear that you would use on any expedition of any kind around the world. And so we launched a store. It was hugely successful. 
we started to take off, the our manufacturers, they usually open more stores, more stores, open more stores. Oh yeah, you want more doors so we can sell more of your crap. There's a lot of, a lot of risk in that. It's capital intensive. Man, we got other real estate plays are complicated. The obligations for that. The leasehold improvements, let alone the employees and the commitment to them. No. I don't know if that's really scalable for us in the long run. There's this other thing going on. We hear, we smell, we hear, we taste. This internet thing. Selling shit online. What's up with that? You start studying. There's this company, backcountry.com. Love them in the States. Nobody's doing it in Canada. We're doing that in Canada. We fire up a page, which soon will become a site. Start selling stuff out the back of the store. Wow, we sold a thousand bucks worth of stuff that day. Wow, if we could just get to 30 grand, if we could sell 30 grand in a month, that would boost our sales, boost our profit. That'd be great if we could just have a good little business. I'm gonna get 30 grand, I'm thinking, 30 grand, man, we need to get a million bucks. We gotta do a million bucks of this. We gotta get to a million bucks of selling on this. When we get to a million bucks, we'll be able to manage, we'll be cash flow, positive, we'll just be going for it. Oh, fantastic. That's what we're gonna do. Well, how are we gonna do that, though? I mean, if you're gonna use Sherpas, partner with Sherpas to climb Mount Everest, if you're gonna partner with Bedouin to cross the desert, who are you gonna partner with to get this thing done? You gotta find the best, the experts, the people. So we did our research, cast out our line. Who are we going to partner with to run our operation? Who's going to be with us when it gets ugly, when the camels are dropping down, when we're drying up like raisins? Who's going to help us get this dream realized? Ah, there's this Magento thing. Our director of, of technology is here. Drew, come up here for two seconds. We only have a couple seconds left. <laughs> Drew Gilson. It was Drew. Drew picked you, not me. Drew, you're a perfect example of wanting to be in a room with people who are smarter than me. Drew makes me the unequivocal dumbass when we're in the room together. <laughs> Drew, I have one quick question for you. Why did you pick Magento? So when I first discovered Magento in 2008, I immediately realized it was not just another shopping cart app. It was, it, it struck me, it was the most flexible, configurable, multifunctional application development framework for e-commerce that I'd ever seen. So when I pitched it to Jamie and I said, hey, we should use this Magento thing, he says, oh, great, what's Magento? <laughs> Dumbass, remember? <laughs> and so I said at that time, you know, it, it's kind of like that Swiss Army knife that you would never think of leaving home without. And so Jamie, his eyes brightened and he said, oh, gotcha. I get that, I get that. And so since then, for us, for the last four years, Magento has powered explosive growth, so triple digit growth from 2009 through to 2013, where we're at today. Thanks to your efforts, my friend. Joe Gilson, Director of Technology. <laughs> Smart guy, he's got to dumb stuff down for the boss. Dude, it's a Swiss Army knife. Get that, we need that, we have that on the trip right away. Get a headlamp too, whatever you need. Get some dehydrated food and some yaks. We're gonna get this done. I'm not saying it's easy though, partners can be a pain in the ass. Sometimes it's heavy lifting, you know that to be the truth. But this is an adventure, we're doing new things. The outcome is unknown. If it was gonna be easy, other people would do it. The fact that it's difficult, that means we're onto something. That means we're really onto something. I like it when the weather's bad. I like it when it's nasty, because everybody quits and goes back. But you were in the right when the weather breaks to be in position to take advantage of it. So when you peel back our skin, what do you see beneath it? We bleed orange. I'm sitting in a boardroom on Monday, yesterday, what day is it, Tuesday? We're sitting, we're doing another round of financing. The first day of it with our current investors, only a couple of them we brought together, we raised a third of what we needed. I'm sitting in the board, wow, we got a warehouse, we have people, projected a million bucks next boxing day. It was just like crazy stuff going on. I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, wow, remember when we were in a coffee shop, man, doing this? And my credit cards were all racked up and my house was mortgaged, and line of credit. Those were the good old days, you know, when you didn't know. I wish we were back there again, just getting started. Now we're killing it. And then it realized, God damn it, it struck me. I said, you know, Jamie, I was actually talking to myself. It's a bit weird, but I did. <laughs> it's altitude sickness, long-term impact. I said, you know, but dude, how much of your life are you living in the future and in the past? Always looking something in the future. We're going to do 50 million and 70 million and 80 million. Yeah, yeah. And then you get there and they're like, oh, remember when we were desperate and poor and going nuts and couldn't sleep? Oh. Remember when you were on the mountain? Remember when you were riding a camel? You're living in the two places you're not. I'm just learning about the art of commerce. But I can tell you about the art of life. And that's about living in the moment. Thanks very much.